good afternoon, distinguished ladies and gentlemen. Your Excellency, Ms. Mohammed, Deputy Secretary General, Dr. Natalia Kanin, Secretary of the Committee for the United Nations Population Award and Executive Director of the UNFPA, members of the Committee for the United Nations Population Award, I warmly welcome you all to the 2018 United Nations Population Award Ceremony. I would like to express a heartfelt appreciation to Her Excellency Dr. Amina Mohammed, Deputy Secretary General of the United Nations, who is standing in for the Secretary General. We are truly honored to have her join us this afternoon. Excellencies, the United Nations Population Award was established in 1981 in recognition of the important linkages between population and development issues and to pay tribute to individuals and institutions for their outstanding work in increasing public awareness of population questions and to their solutions. Our festive ceremony today to honor three deserving laureates is a further testimony of the continued relevance of the awards and the fact that it continues to inspire actions and programs that positively impact on the well-being of people and nations across the globe. The award signals our conviction that population issues in the context of equitable and sustainable development are critical to building a peaceful world in balance with environment and people-centered development. We recall in this regard that the program of action of the International Conference on Population and Development adopted in 1994 did not only link individual well-being to inclusive economic growth and development, but also sought to integrate population concerns into every aspect of development. It laid the cornerstone for an integrated approach to fulfilling people's needs and fostering sustainable development, and also placed human rights at the center of population and development concerns. Excellencies, since this award was first presented in 1982, and especially since the International Conference on Population and Development, we have made considerable achievements. These include the fact that people are living longer and healthier lives than ever before, and hundreds of millions fewer people living in extreme poverty. We have witnessed progress in providing access to education, sexual and reproductive health care services, which have improved the lives of women and children in many parts of the world. A decline of almost 50% in the rate of maternal deaths and of about one quarter in the number of births per woman are a testament to the profound importance of addressing population issues based on human rights and dignity. As we celebrate these and other achievements, we must renew our commitment to address those challenges that continue to militate against our progress towards transformative and inclusive development for all. Our sustained commitment is necessary to ensure that the gains of the past are not lost. Continued progress is critical for the achievement of the 2030 Agenda for Sustainable Development. We are reminded that one in three girls in developing countries is married before the age of 18, limiting her socioeconomic potential and subjecting her to threats to her health and life in some cases. While more than 800 women die daily from pregnancy and childbirth-related causes, including unsafe abortions, at least 215 million in total worldwide do not have access to modern methods of family planning. 
excellencies, our world today has the largest number of young people in history. And the evidence has been clear for some time now that young people represent either the promise of innovative cultural and social change as well as economic renewal or the threat of unmet expectations and social instability. Investment in human capital, especially for youth, can result in a demographic dividend necessary for accelerating the country's economic growth. Concerted and deliberate policies to targeting women's inclusion will further enhance these dividends. In fact, the transformative 2030 agenda is clear that unless the issues related to the education, health, skills, decent employment, participation and rights of young people, men and women, become central to policies, we will fail to achieve the goal of leaving no one behind, the larger goal of sustainable development. This is why population issues are more relevant today than ever before. Unless we harness the potential of the world's 1.8 billion young people, many of whom have no access to quality education, lack skills and access to quality health care, including sexual and reproductive health information, education and services, we will not achieve the future we want. The United Nations Population Award, the most prestigious award given annually in the United Nations system, has proven to be a powerful instrument for promoting awareness of population questions and honoring the, the significant contributions of individuals and institutions that have put such knowledge to the service of mankind. I call upon all stakeholders including government representatives, civil society, academia, the private sector, and media, to help draw attention to the importance of the award within your respective constituencies, in order to encourage more individuals, institutions, to bring their contributions to the attention of the committee through the established nomination processes. It is our hope that this will lead to higher awareness of the importance of population issues and ultimately to eliciting the desired responses from governments, civil society organizations, communities, and individuals everywhere to the achievement of our shared objectives. I thank you. Excellencies, ladies and gentlemen, on behalf of the committee, let me congratulate the laureates of the 2018 United Nations Population Award. In the individual category, Dr. Sir Prince Ramsey of Antigua and Barbuda. In the institutional category, Guttmacher Institute, represented by Ms. Ann Stars, President and Save a Child's Heart, represented by, by Dr. Leo Sasson. I assure you that choosing from among a highly deserving group of nominees is never an easy matter. For the three laureates that have been selected, we hope this is an adequate recognition of their inspiring work. Now, I would also like to welcome the New York Symphonic Ensemble, who will perform a musical item.
Excellencies, ladies and gentlemen, it is now time for the actual event for which we have gathered. We will now proceed with the reading of the citations and presentations of the award, which includes a medal, a diploma, and a monetary prize. The presentation of each award will be preceded by a musical number. The General Assembly has declared that this award be presented for, and I quote, the most outstanding contribution to the awareness of population questions or to their solutions, unquote. The diplomas to be presented here seek to reflect the contributions of these laureates that they have made towards that effort. It is my great pleasure to invite Dr. Natalia Kanem, Secretary of the Committee for the United Nations Population Award and Executive Director of UNFPA, to read the citation on the diploma of the laureate in the individual category. Dr. Sir Prince Ramsey, in recognition of his distinguished work and contribution to healthcare in Antigua and Barbuda and the wider Caribbean, and for championing globally for more than three decades people's health, including their right to a healthy reproductive life and to family planning, for his longstanding dedication and leadership in advocacy and healthcare services, especially family health care. For spearheading the understanding of the medical and social impacts of HIV and AIDS, including by encouraging and supporting community activism to end the HIV and AIDS epidemic. For his significant achievements in providing affected AIDS patients with all required antiretroviral medications before they were widely available, sometimes at his own cost. For volunteering his expertise and lecturing throughout the Caribbean on HIV and AIDS to raise awareness and to educate and guide others in the fight against the HIV and AIDS epidemic. Thank you, Dr. Kenny. We will now listen to a musical item as I invite the Deputy Secretary General to present the diploma, the medal, and the monetary prize to Dr. Sir Prince Ramsey. Thank you. 
Deputy Secretary General. I kindly request Dr. Kanim to read the citation on the diploma of the first laureate in the institutional category. Guttmacher Institute, in recognition of 50 years of commitment to advancing family planning and sexual and reproductive health and reproductive rights worldwide for its leading role in impartial research for the development of sound government policies and programs in the United States and also globally, for its authoritative studies on contraceptive use and services, adolescent sexual and reproductive health, and pregnancy outcomes, for its multifaceted research on unintended pregnancy, abortion incidents and safety, maternal and newborn health, HIV and AIDS, and men's sexual and reproductive health, and for excellence in producing policy-relevant and evidence-based advocacy crucial for the promotion of sexual and reproductive health. Thank you, Dr. Kane. We will now listen to a musical item as I invite the Deputy Secretary General again to present the diploma, the medal, and the monetary prize to the Guttmacher Institute, represented here today by their president, Ms. Ann Stars. Thank you, Deputy Secretary General. I kindly request Dr. Kanim to read the citation on the diploma of the second laureate in the institutional category. Save a child's heart. In recognition of over 20 years of improving the health and welfare of children, regardless of race, nationality, or financial status through life-saving cardiac surgeries for children from developing countries, for initiating programs in developing countries, for training physicians and other medical personnel in cardiology to provide service to patients in their home communities, including by setting up local centers of excellence in cardiac surgery, and for inspiring young people to raise awareness and support for life-saving heart surgeries. Thank you, Dr. Kanim. We will now listen to a musical item as I invite the Deputy Secretary General to present the diploma the medal, and the monetary prize to save a child's heart represented here today by Dr. Leo Sasson, head of the cardiothoracic surgery department at Wolfson Medical Center and lead surgeon.
Thank you, Deputy Secretary General. I have great pleasure now in inviting our orchestra to conclude the presentation part of the ceremony with a musical performance. Excellencies, ladies and gentlemen, I have great pleasure in inviting our distinguished guest, the Deputy Secretary General of the United Nations, Ms. Amina Mohammed, to deliver her remarks. Thank you, Your Excellency Ambassador Martha Phoebe, Chairperson of the Committee of the United Nations Population Award, Dr. Natalia Kanem, the Executive Director of UNFPA, two incredible women of substance. So I'd like to give them a hand because they are wonderful <laughs> leaders. <laughs> Members of the Committee for the United Nations Population Award are distinguished laureates, excellencies, ladies and gentlemen. I really am delighted to join you here today for this important event, and let me begin by thanking the members of the committee for the United Nations Population Award for their work over the past few months, which has brought us here today. Each year, the United Nations Population Award recognizes and celebrates the work and dedication of people and institutions that are saving and transforming lives and making outstanding contributions to the field of population and development. Since it was first conferred 35 years ago, this award has become a touchstone to global efforts to put people at the center of sustainable development. And this year's award ceremony is no different. Population is, after all, not just about numbers, but about people, about the choices they're able to make. And this understanding took root 24 years ago in Cairo at the International Conference on Population and Development. Leaders from around the world came together to transform our approach 
to population and development, and to ensure the centrality to sustainable development of individual health, dignity, and rights. And this includes our youth, women's choices, and the economy. The Cairo Program of Action has led to better health and better lives for millions of people around the world, particularly our women and our girls. And we see it reflected in the 2030 Agenda for Sustainable Development. Human rights, individual agency, and evidence-based decision-making are at the heart of our global goals for sustainable development because they are fundamental to individual health and well-being, to building more prosperous and sustainable societies, and to leaving absolutely no one behind. They are also at the heart of the work of this year's laureates who are being recognized for their varied and rich contributions to the nexus of population and public health. Excellencies, ladies and gentlemen, this year we honor the remarkable achievements of three laureates whose contributions have, in very different ways, inspired and informed our collective efforts to improve lives and achieve sustainable development. Serving humanity by serving lives and supporting policy change for results is at the center of their contribution. First, let me again congratulate our laureates in the individual category, Dr. Sir Prince Ramsey, a family phys physician from Antigua and Barbuda. Dr. Ramsey was one of the first to recognize the devastating effects of HIV and AIDS in the country. And in response, he emerged as a prominent expert and a champion in combating the epidemic, not only in Antigua and Barbuda, but throughout the Caribbean. While Dr. Ramsey advanced the clinical treatment of HIV and AIDS, providing life-saving antiretroviral medications free of charge to patients from disadvantaged com communities, he also provided leadership in advocacy to address the social impact of the disease, co-founding the Health, Hope, and HIV Foundation to help patients, their families, and friends cope with the stigma surrounding the disease. He also pioneered the prevention of mother-to-child transmission of HIV throughout the Caribbean, facilitating the treatment of pregnant mothers living with HIV. In 2017, the World Health Organization recognized Antigua and Barbuda and five other Caribbean countries for their achievements in eliminating mother-to-child transmission of HIV. Let me... Yeah, let's go ahead. Let me also con congratulate our two laureates in the institutional category, the Guttmacher Institute USA and the Save a Child's Heart from Israel. Founded in 1968, the Institute is a leading research and policy organization committed to advancing sexual and reproductive health and reproductive rights worldwide. It has filled a vital niche as a credible source of high quality scientific research on sexual and reproductive health and as a center of excellence in translating evidence into policy change in support of reproductive rights. Its international work encompasses research and policy engagement designed to provide valuable data to inform key policy debates. During its 50 years of work, the Institute has increasingly expanded its efforts to developing countries guided by an abiding concern for the health and the rights of the marginalized and vulnerable populations including our adolescents, ethnic, racial, and sexual minorities. The evidence generated by the Institute helps fill critical gaps in knowledge and contributes to advocacy efforts. That's stimulating increased investments in sexual and reproductive health and in the design of more effective programs and interventions in public health. In close coordination with international organizations and leading research institutions, the Institute also works to translate complex research findings into messages that policymakers, stakeholders, and the public can readily engage and embrace. Established in 1996, Save a Child's Heart provides life-saving cardiac surgery for children from developing countries, regardless of race, nationality, or financial status. By providing treatment that would otherwise be unattainable to them, the organization enables these children to live healthier and more productive lives and contribute to their communities. Many of the estimated five million children in developing nations living with congenital heart disease will die before the age of 20 because they lack access to facilities or doctors capable of performing the life-saving surgery they need. 
As early treatment is critical to save lives and lessen the burden on families and communities, Save a Child's Heart not only provides life-saving heart surgeries and follow-up care, but also provides training in Israel to physicians in developing countries so that they can return to home and treat patients within their own communities. To date, the organization has trained over 100 medical personnel and saved the lives of 4,400 children from 55 developing countries. That is just amazing and God sent. <laughs> Excellencies, ladies and gentlemen, on behalf of the United Nations Secretary General, Antonio Guterres, and myself, I commend our honorees and I would also like to take this opportunity to pay tribute to the late Professor Babatunde Oshutemeng, former Executive Director of UNFPA, whose legacy of tireless commitment to social progress is the very much in the spirit of today's celebration. Please join me in offering warm congratulations and sincere appreciation to Dr. Sir Prince Ramsey, the Guttmacher Institute, and Save a Child's Heart for their contributions to saving and improving lives. Lastly, let me reiterate my gratitude to the members of the UN Population Award Committee for their dedication. With the tenure of the current committee coming to an end this year, I encourage member states to continue participating actively and nominating these wonderful people, our laureates, so that the crucial work done in the service of humanity by organizations such as Today Awardees continues receiving the recognition it so rightly deserves. Our essential commodity in the United Nations is hope. And today we see much of that around in the work of our laureates. I thank you so much and wish you all a wonderful evening. Thank you very much, Deputy Secretary General. I now invite the orchestra to perform a fanfare. Thanks to our orchestra. I now invite the distinguished laureates to deliver their respective acceptance statements. We will start with the individual category laureate. I have great pleasure in giving the floor to Dr. Sir Prince Ramsey. Good evening. Her Excellency, Ms. Amina Mohammed, Deputy Secretary General of the United Nations, Executive Director of UNFPA, Dr. Natalia Kanem. Kanem. Her Excellency, Ms. Martha Pobi, Permanent Representative to, of Ghana to the United Nations and Chief Personal Committee for the United Nations Population. His Excellency, Dr. Walton Aubrey Webson, Permanent Representative of Antigua and Barbuda to the United Nations. Fellow laureates, your excellencies, distinguished ladies and gentlemen, family, friends, and fellow Antiguan and Barbudans. I'm immensely pleased and honored to accept this prestigious United Nations Population Award for my contribution to the medical community, and in particular, to HIV and AIDS in Antiguan and Barbuda and the wider Caribbean. 
I consider myself to be extremely fortunate. I would like to thank the chairperson, Her Excellency Ambassador Martha Pobi, and the committee for selecting me as the 2018 Individual Laureate. I am pleased and honored to accept this award for three very special reasons. Firstly, during the past few years, I've received many awards locally, regionally, and internationally. These include Officer Brother of the Most Venerable Order of the Hospital of St. John of Jerusalem in 2003 from Her Majesty Queen Elizabeth II, a knighthood, the Knight Grand Cross of the Most Distinguished Order of the Nation, the KGCN in 2007 from the Government and People of Antigua and Barbuda. The Order of Excellence from the Pan-Caribbean Partnership Against HIV and AIDS in 2012 for my contribution to HIV and AIDS in the Caribbean, and more recently, in 2016, October, I received an honorary degree, the Doctor of Science, from my alma mater, the University of the West Indies. However, however this latest honor is priceless to me because this award is being bestowed by the United Nations, representing 193 countries. It means then that the world is recognizing me for my contribution to medicine, and in particular, my fight against HIV and AIDS. I am thank thankful to God for the opportunities he gave me so that I could help others. The good book says that it is more blessed to give than to receive, but it also acknowledges that reward sweetens labor. <laughs> Thus, when one is given a reward such as this, it is not only an incentive, but a blessing as well. Secondly, I'm sure that you've all heard the, the, the queen, you're all acquainted with the saying, you're known by the company that you keep. I'm led to think about the individuals before me who have received this prestigious award. I'm led to consider the pro prolific group they represent, their diverse and vast talents and their tremendous accomplishments. Imagine I am now a member of, this, of a space that is inhabited by an elite group of people, such as Bill Gates, Mahatma um, Gandhi, and Professor Hugh Winter, my former professor of obstetrics and gynecology while I was in medical school. The third reason is that receiving this award disproves the notion that the prophet is without honor in his country. It was the Antigua and Barbie, the head of mission in New York, His Excellency Ambassador Orby Webson, who suggested that I would be a good nominee for this award. I would like to thank him for his thoughtfulness. Thanks also to his supporting staff, Ms. Michelle Lightfoot and Asha Challenger. It was the Minister of Health and Wellness of Antigua and Barbuda, the Honorable Malvin Joseph, who nominated me to the United Nations Committee on behalf of the government and people of Antigua. I would like to thank him also at this time. A letter of support supporting my nomination was written by my friend and colleague, the Governor General of Antigua and Barbuda, His Excellency Sir Rodney Williams. To him I say a special hearty thank you also. I served on the board of the Caribbean Family Planning Affiliation as a member and treasurer during the late 80s and early 90s. The Caribbean Family Planning Association had 21 member countries at that time. And this organization also supported my nomination. I would like to thank Mr. Adler Bino, the CEO of the Caribbean Family Planning Affiliation for his letter of support. I was also the CFP representative on the International Planned Parenthood Federation. Western Hemisphere region. This board represents 48 countries, including the United States, Canada, Latin America, and the Caribbean. Thanks to the CEO and regional director, Ms. Giselle Carino, and Ms. Cecilia Campbell for their letter of support to the United Nations Committee. Now, I could not have accomplished all these many successes without the support of my dear wife of 36 years, Ava Lady Ramsley, who tolerated me during my early years of, of obsession with HIV and AIDS. She should be getting. <clears throat> so this award is hers, really. <laughs> when um, Ava and our two children, Ray and Ryan, Reynold and Ryan, are very pleased to accept this honor being conferred upon me today. I would like also to thank those who contributed to my success in any way, as I could not have done it on my own. I say special thanks to my two nurses of 36 years each. 36 years, that's good. <laughs> nurse Patricia Ramsey and Nurse Shemelita John Edwards. And my secretary of 34 years, and she's in the audience, Mrs. Gwendolyn Pell. Thanks once again.
During the early days of my solar campaign on HIV and AIDS, there was a gentleman by the name of Mr. Ivor Bird who owned a radio station in Antigua Barbuda called ZDK. He, had, as well as an anchor at the station, Mr. Robert Bobby Reese, both encouraged me in the early days and invited me to spread the message on, about HIV and to inform the public of Antigua and Barbuda. As such, the citizens were educated about this disease even before our first case in 1985, thanks to those two gentlemen. Ladies and gentlemen, I had the privilege as a teenager of finishing school in England and then pursuing a medical degree in Jamaica at the University of the West Indies. For those opportunities, I say thanks to my parents and my siblings who made it possible. My brothers Kelly and Mitchell and my sister Gloria in the audience I'd like to recognize them. Thank you all very much. My other two sisters, um, Pansy and Amy, were unable to attend. I'd just like to say thanks to them too. Now, testing has become a very important part of HIV management. And in 2003, I advocated that the oral HIV test should be sold in pharmacies so that people could test themselves in the privacy of their homes. I met with a lot of objections at the time and criticisms from my colleagues and others, not only in Antigua, but regionally and internationally. It was said, quote, I was irresponsible, that people um, should be pre counseled before getting an HIV test, and that many people would commit suicide. In the United States, HIV self-testing was finally made available on the 30th of July, 2012, some nine years after my suggestion. People have often wondered what caused me to immerse myself into a disease that caused so much fear and revulsion from the world at large, and one that would forever classify me, quote, the AIDS doctor, rather than a family physician. You often hear at international HIV AIDS conferences, or if you Google HIV in the Caribbean, you will see this statement. The Caribbean is the second most affected region in the world in terms of HIV prevalence rates. Second only to sub-Saharan Africa. Now, this statement is depressing the Caribbean people who have been fighters of this disease over the years. We in the Caribbean have been working hard to eliminate the stigma. In 2005, the governments of the Organization of Eastern Caribbean, OECS, appointed a clinical care coordinator in each island. Yours truly was appointed at, um, for Antigua and Barbuda. The government made available free of cost testing, care, and treatment. We saw results very early in our campaign. Between 2007 and 2008, new infections fell from 20,000 to 17,000 in the Caribbean. According to UNAIDS, in 2004, eight related deaths fell from by 59% since 2005. So that was a great achievement. In July 2015, the United Nations stated the Caribbean, quote, the Caribbean leads the world in reducing the number of new HIV AIDS infection. The region recorded the biggest drop in new infections compared to all regions in the world, unquote. Um, this is a great achievement for the Caribbean, and I'm glad that and proud that to have been a part of it. Now, no one can dispute the fact that treatment makes a difference. In 2001, the editor of the HIV AIDS magazine, Dr. Gail Defoe, came down from Canada to interview me and some of my patients after learning about our parents' successful treatment. All right? So that was a magazine that was published, AIDS makes a, a Treatment Makes a Difference. In the early 90s, I started treating patients with HIV as soon as the diagnosis was made, whether or not they had signs or symptoms. Many criticized my approach to care and treatment since there was a World Health Organization WHO guideline. A study was carried out between 2006 and 2015 to determine the effectiveness of early treatment. It was called a STAR study, START, Strategic Timing of Antiretroviral Treatment. The trial found, quote, early treatment improves the outcome for people with HIV, unquote. In September 13th, 2015, some 20 years later, well, World Health Organization mandated that all patients diagnosed with HIV 
should be treated immediately regardless of signs, symptoms, or CD4 count. So 20 years before we did that in Antigua. <clears throat> Ladies and gentlemen, treatment makes a difference. In the audience is my longest living HIV patient of 35 years, Mr. Winston Christian. Could you just stand and uh, let us please recognize him? Hmm. It was recognized since 1983 that mothers could transmit HIV to their babies. Evidence showed that the infection could occur in the womb while passing through the vagina or by breastfeeding, and that the transmission rate was 17 to 35 percent. Research also indicated that if an infected pregnant woman is treated, treated during pregnancy with antiretroviral therapy, the transmission rate was reduced to 8 percent. If a C-section, cesarean section uh, is performed, the rate would be further reduced to 2 percent. If the baby is treated with ACT at birth, the rate would go down to 0.8 percent. With this information, in 1999, the ACE Secretary in Antigua and Barbados, headed by the ACE Program Manager, Mrs. Felicity Amer, Dr. A Dane Abbott, an obstetrician gynecologist, and myself, with our team, set out on a mission to eliminate the transmission of this virus from mother to child. With a government-funded program, care and treatment for all pregnant women became free. They were offered antiretrovirals and cesarean section, and the babies were treated soon after birth. Breastfeeding was not permitted. Free milk formula was given for nine months, and medication was given to the mothers to dry their breast milk, the tablet that we use um, called Paladil. Ladies and gentlemen, the rest is history. On the 1st of December 2017, World Health Organization validated Antigua and Barbuda as one of the few countries in the world achieving the elimination of mother-to-child transmission. That is here. Uh, ladies and gentlemen, I have two hobbies. One of them is playing dominoes, and the other one is writing calypsos. Um, <laughs> and I would like to, I penned a calypso some years ago called Protect Yourself. I'd like to share two verses with you, if you don't mind. Um, right. We may not know just how AIDS began. We may not know. Just how it's begun But we surely know The mode of transmission Sexual encounter Without protection So we are exposed To this infection Some pregnant women Still refuse testing Some insist on breastfeeding Even Your Excellencies, ladies and gentlemen, be assured that I accept this honor with pride and humility, ever mindful that I represent my nation and my people wherever Antiguans and Barbados are to be found. May God bless you all. Thank you very much. Thank you, Dr. Ramsey, for your statement. I now have great pleasure in inviting the representative of the Institutional Category Laureate to deliver her acceptance statement. I give the floor to Ms. Ann Stars, President of the Guttmacher Institute.
Good evening, everyone. Thank you to Her Excellency Martha Pobi, Permanent Representative of the Republic of Ghana to the United Nations, Her Excellency Amina Mohammed, Deputy Secretary General of the UN, Dr. Natalia Kanem, Executive Director of UNFPA, my distinguished fellow honorees, Dr. Sir Prince Ramsey and Dr. Lior Sasson, and thank you to all of you, the guests, with whom we are privileged to share this moment. As has already been shared, this year, the Guttmacher Institute marks its 50th anniversary. As we reach this milestone, it is especially gratifying to have our work recognized and our issues recognized in this way by the United Nations. We could not be more honored. Before I proceed, I want to say a few words about a recent development at the Guttmacher Institute that some of you may have heard about. An accusation of sexual harassment was made against a senior staff member. An investigation was conducted, and the staff member's employment was terminated last week. For all of us at Guttmacher, this event brings home, in very personal and profound terms, the vital importance of respect for personal autonomy, of listening to women's voices, and of understanding the impact that differentials in power, influence, and authority have on people's lives. Issues that underlie sexual and reproductive health and equality for women in every home, every workplace, and every community. As we accept this ward and acknowledge the many people who have contributed to Guttmacher's success, I also want to thank the brave women who came forward and made their voices heard, helping to pave the way towards a different, better, and fairer future. The Institute was founded in 1968 to serve a specific mission, to generate reliable evidence aimed at informing policies and programs on sexual and reproductive health and rights. During our first decade, our work focused on the United States, and it helped to transform access to reproductive health services for women and young people. Guttmacher's research and analysis helped lead to the establishment of a national network of family planning clinics to meet the contraceptive needs of low-income women, a network that currently serves over four million women annually and whose continued existence is under threat. Guttmacher's work during these years documented the scope and consequences of unintended pregnancy among U.S. adolescents. That work spurred action to ensure access for minors to confidential contraceptive services and to comprehensive school-based sexuality education, programs that have helped young people take control of their sexual and reproductive lives and contributed to reductions in American adolescents' rate of unintended pregnancy to record low levels. In the early 1980s, we began working in low- and middle-income countries, focusing on settings that had the fewest resources, the poorest health com outcomes, and the greatest evidence gaps. We have generated unique and groundbreaking data on unintended pregnancy, abortion, and the costs and benefits of providing reproductive health services in specific countries and regions. Our approach was then, as it remains today, entirely collaborative. Every country-specific research study is undertaken jointly with local partners, often universities, research institutes, or ministries of health. From the development of an idea, to research design and implementation, to the dissemination of findings, these collaborations have ensured local ownership and provided important capacity-building opportunities with each side enriched by the other. Today, our international activities account for half of our programmatic work. As with our US programs, we are guided by the conviction that evidence is the foundation of good policy and by an abiding concern for the health and rights of marginalized and vulnerable populations. The Institute's work is widely viewed as being high impact, high quality, and urgently needed. And our blend of science and action remains just as crucial and powerful today as it has been for the past 50 years. What has been the impact of this work? 
The Guttmacher Institute has generated some of the most widely cited data on reproductive health, and these data have been the catalyst for historic and far-reaching policy changes on sexual and reproductive health and rights issues. Since our Adding It Up series, co-produced by the Guttmacher Institute and UNFPA, was launched in 2004, it has brought global attention to the scope and impact of the unmet need for family planning, the gap that exists when a woman wants to avoid pregnancy but is not using a contraceptive method. Every five years, the Guttmacher Institute and UNFPA issue a report documenting the unmet need for family planning among women in developing regions and the costs and benefits of addressing those needs. Few other studies have made the case for investing in family planning and reproductive health so comprehensively and so compellingly. The current adding it up estimate of unmet need for modern contraception, which was cited earlier this evening, 214 million women, is one of the most widely cited data points used in family planning advocacy. The evidence shows that each additional dollar invested in contraceptive services results in more than $2 in savings for maternal and newborn care. This analysis makes the economic as well as the public health and rights argument for investing in reproductive health care. Guttmacher's research helps shape program interventions as well as policy decisions. In Ghana, for example, we asked why women are not using contraception when they do not want to have a child. Concerns about the side effects and health risks associated with contraceptive use and women's perception that they were not at risk of getting pregnant, not the cost of services or their distance to a family planning clinic, were the most common reasons that women gave. Even more intriguing, most women who said they were concerned about the side effects of contraceptive methods based their response not on their own experiences, but on what they had heard from other women, highlighting the importance of social networks in shaping women's views regarding reproductive health. Building on our decades of work on adolescent sexual and reproductive health, last year we examined the provision of comprehensive sexuality education in four countries, Ghana, Kenya, Peru, and Guatemala, documenting the gap that exists between what national policies say should be provided to young people and what actually takes place in the classroom. Here's one example. While 75% of Kenyan teachers surveyed reported that they teach comprehensive sexuality, only 2% of surveyed students said they had received comprehensive instruction. This eye-opening study has already helped promote change. In Ghana, the National Population Council commissioned new guidelines for the implementation of sexuality education curricula, which cited our study, and the national syllabus on sexuality education is being revised. As everyone in this room is no doubt aware, abortion is a common procedure in almost every country in the world. Some 56 million abortions occur each year worldwide. What is less well known is that abortion occurs as frequently where laws ban or restrict the procedure as it does where it is legal. The crucial difference is safety. Where abortion is performed under clandestine conditions, it is often unsafe taking a significant toll on women and their families. Between 22,000 and 31,000 women die each year from complications of unsafe abortion, and seven million women are treated annually. Even that seven million figure is just the tip of the iceberg. Some 40% of women who experience serious complications from unsafe abortion never get the medical care they need. Poor women, rural women, and young women are the least likely to have access to safe abortion and are most at risk of experiencing and dying from serious complications. The work we and our partners have done to document the incidence and impact of abortion provides a foundation in evidence for what otherwise tend to be contentious, emotional, and fact-free debates. This evidence, in turn, enables the adoption of practical policy changes. In Rwanda, for example, research on unsafe abortion conducted in collaboration with the University of Rwanda helped to bring about reforms to the National Penal Code to, exact, to expand legal access 
to abortion and post-abortion care services. In Mexico, our work in collaboration with the Colegio de Mexico helped to convince the Supreme Court to uphold the liberalization of Mexico City's abortion law. In Colombia, a successful legal challenge to the country's restrictive abortion law was informed by our work in collaboration with Fundación Orientame. And in Uganda, research conducted with Makere University was instrumental in convincing the Ministry of Health to adopt new standards and guidelines for the management of unintended pregnancy and abortion. So where do we go from here? As the 25th anniversary of the landmark International Conference on Population and Development approaches, we celebrate the progress that has been made toward the goal of achieving universal access to sexual and reproductive health. But we also acknowledge the scope of the unfinished agenda. Gains have been slow and inequitable. Political commitment and funding have been inadequate. And crucial elements of sexual and reproductive health and rights have been ignored. How can we reshape, refresh, and renew the global commitment to sexual and reproductive health and rights? Two years ago, in collaboration with The Lancet and the African Population and Health Research Center, we formed the Commission on Sexual and Reproductive Health and Rights. This initiative brought together 16 experts from a range of disciplines in Africa, Asia, Europe, the Middle East, and the Americas to assess the evidence and define a new agenda. Last month, after two years of intensive work, we released our findings and recommendations. The Commission's report offers a comprehensive, integrated, and inspiring vision for sexual and reproductive health and rights that is both affordable and achievable. It encompasses the right of all individuals to make decisions about their bodies and lives, free of stigma, discrimination, and coercion, and to have access to a set of essential sexual and reproductive health interventions. Central to this vision is the view that sexual and reproductive health cannot be achieved without realizing sexual and reproductive rights. This bold vision is essential to individual progress and the health of families, but it is also indisp indispensable to promoting economic well-being, to strengthening communities, and to enabling nations to achieve their developmental goals. The response to the report's publication highlights how widely and enthusiastically its vision is shared. The government of Sweden called for the essential package of sexual and reproductive health interventions laid out in the commission, Commission's report to serve as a central pillar of universal health coverage. The government of South Africa is using the package to guide the development of its national policy on sexual and reproductive health. And NGO colleagues around the world have taken up the comprehensive definition of sexual and reproductive health and rights, promoting it through social media and advocating for its adoption. It is sometimes tempting to become discouraged and disillusioned by the dismissal of facts and the rejection of scientific evidence that we too often see around us. Yet when we look at the 25 years since ICPD or the 50 years since Guttmacher was founded, there is also ground for hope and optimism. As we look to the future and the promise of the 2030 Agenda for Sustainable Development, together we can and we must reaffirm our commitment to making sexual and reproductive health and rights a reality for all people. Thank you. Thank you, Ms. Stars. I now have great pleasure in inviting the representative of the second institutional category laureate to deliver his acceptance statement. I give the floor to Dr. Leo Sasson, head of the cardiothoracic surgery department at Wolfson Medical Center and Save a Child's Heart lead surgeon. Thank you very much. Before I start, I urge you to pay attention because there's going to be an exam. 
about all the facts that I'm going to tell you about. Your Excellency, Dr. Natalia Kanem, Executive Director of United Nations Population Fund, President of the Award Committee for the United Nations Population Fund Awards, Excellencies, Distinguished Delegates, Ladies and Gentlemen. I am excited to be here today with my colleagues, Dr. Tzion Khouri, Head of the Pediatric Intensive Care Unit, and Dr. Akiva Tamir, Head of Pediatric Cardiology, from the Volson Medical Center in Hulon, Israel. We, we are very proud to accept this prestigious award from the United Nations Population Fund on behalf of a large group of dedicated and generous volunteers, medical teams, philanthropists, and our global organization, Save a Child's Heart. Allow me to take you 19 years back to 1999 when one extraordinary individual made an, an enormous difference. The place is Ethiopia. 15-year-old street boy Yared, suffering from life-threatening heart disease, was referred to a local hospital. Most people don't know that about one out of every 100 children are born with congenital heart disease. And though most of these children have correctable conditions, the majority of them will die before the age of 20 as a result of lack of facilities and doctors capable of performing the life-saving heart surgery or catheterization they so desperately need. In Yard's case, however, the local doctor, Dr. Belaya Begaz, grasped the gravity of Yard's illness and he knew he must be flown immediately to Israel to undergo life-saving heart surgery at the Volson Medical Center. His operation was a great success, and so was everything that followed. The experience not only saved him, but also inspired him to give back to his own community. Yard studied education and opened a school that houses more than 100 children and orphans that would be otherwise be homeless, hungry, in danger, and living on the street. At his school, Yard feeds them, educates them, and encourage them to reach their full potential. None of this would have been possible if it were not for a passion, vision, and a dream of one individual, the founder of Save a Child's Heart, my mentor and my friend, the late Dr. Ami Cohen. Zichro Livracha. Dr. Cohen trained as a cardiac surgeon in the US Army at the Walter Reed Medical Center in the early 80s. He was sent to serve in Korea, and while doing a tour of duty, he was introduced to someone that would change the course of his life and ours forever, Harriet Hodges. Harriet's mission in life was to help indigent Korean children with heart problems. Ami spent the following year operating on 35 children in her program. Before Ami's untimely death, he reflected on his experience in an article about his life work and wrote, the week I left Korea, I was presented with a $5 plaque of gratitude from these children and their parents. To this day, I, the plaque hangs in my office as one of my prized possessions. And so it all began. In 1992, Dr. Cohen and his family immigrated to Israel, where he was taken under the wing of Professor Aryeh Shachner. Professor Shachner is the president of Save a Child's Heart and former chief and founder of the cardiothoracic department at the Volson Medical Center. Professor Shachner, a compassionate physician and a person of vision and action, recognized Ami as a young and promising cardiac surgeon and made him a member of his surgical staff. In 1995, Doctors Ami Cohen, Akiva Tamir, and Tzion Khouri received their very first patients arriving to Israel from Ethiopia. And Save a Child's Heart was born. Dr. Tamir and Dr. Khouri continue to carry on this heroic work night and day, and they are here with us today. It is my privilege to acknowledge them here this evening.
Savage Child's Heart is, in, is, in, <clears throat> is an Israeli non-governmental organization based at the Volson Medical Center. The mandate of the United Nations Population Fund is in part to deliver a world in which every young person's potential is fulfilled. And we couple this aim with a long-standing Jewish tradition as described in the Bible, to save a life is to save a world. The goals of Save a Child's Heart, as we see it, is to contribute our small part to achieving this mandate and fulfilling this tradition by saving the lives of children with heart disease in the developing world. Without regard to any child's nationality, religion, ethnic origin, or financial resources. Since its establishment in 95, Save a Child's Heart has saved the lives of almost 5,000 children from 57 countries from around the world, allowing them to grow into young and healthy adults and to achieve their potential and their dreams. Of those, more than 2,000 have come from the West Bank and Gaza, and more than 300 came from Iraq and Syria. As I speak, there are 44 children being treated now at the Volson Medical Center in Israel from Ethiopia, Romania, Fiji, Myanmar, Senegal, Tanzania, Zanzibar, and the West Bank and Gaza. Savage Child's Heart, with a special consultative status at the United Nations, accomplishes its missions by carrying out three principal activities. First, as I have men already mentioned, we bring children to Israel and provide life-saving catheterization and surgeries. Second, our medical team travels overseas to screen and treat children on the ground in their home countries. And third, we provide training opportunities in Israel for medical personnel from partner sites to create center of competence in those countries. Sebacha's heart has trained more than 120 medical practitioners from Azerbaijan, China, Congo, Eritrea, Ethiopia, Georgia, Kenya, Moldova, Nepal, Nigeria, Romania, Russia, Tanzania and Zanzibar, Uzbekistan, Vietnam, and the Palestinian Authority. <laughs> the trainees live in our children home for one to five years went with our doctors at Wolfson Medical Center and then returned home, often as the first and only professional in their speciality. Once they have a fully functioning team, the hospital can become a center of competence which lessens the need for children to come to Israel. Center of competence have already been established in China, Moldova, Romania, Tanzania, and are in development in Ethiopia, Zambia, and the Palestinian Authority, providing life-saving treatment each day. We have now Dr. Ahmed Zahru in from Ramallah, training to become a pediatric cardiac surgeon in the Palestinian Authority. Dr. David Silvera has been training with us for two years to return as the second generation of Tanzania's only pediatric cardiac team. Dr. Awano, is training to become Ethiopia's second pediatric cardiac surgeon, while his wife, Dr. Rachel Melako, is training in cardiac anesthesia. Since our modest beginning 23 years ago, Savage Child's Heart has grown dramatically. As I mentioned earlier, at this moment, there are 44 children in Israel from eight different countries. And as my partner and colleagues at the Palestinian Ministry of Health said, disease has no borders. Save a Child's Heart has no political agenda whatsoever. Its only mission is to save lives. Having said that, we hope that by mending hearts, we are building bridges of peace, person to person, nation to nation, and saving a world one heart at a time. Save a Child's Heart is dependent upon the teamwork of highly skilled and selfless group of individuals, doctors, nurses, technicians, staff, volunteers, and donors who are motivated by our Jewish tradition of tikkun olam, which means to mend the world. I wish to acknowledge specifically the next generation of Save a Child's Heart physicians, 
דוקטור חגי דקל עם פדיאטיק קרדק סרג'רי, דוקטור אלונה וואחר עם פדיאטיק קרדיאולוגי, דוקטור סגי אסה עם אינבייזיב פדיאטיק קרדיאולוגי, ודוקטור אילן כהן ודוקטור רחלי סיון שריד עם פדיאטיק אינטנסיב קייר. As the work of my generation tapers off, but not too soon, I hope, I have complete faith that this next generation will lead Sever Child's heart towards new horizons. The right to life is among the most precious of universal human rights, and we at Sever Child's heart strive to help every child with heart disease grow into a young, healthy person and to give each one the opportunity to change and mend the world. This is our motivation. When Yared was 25 years old, he returned back to save a child's heart in Israel, but for a very different reason. He had taken into his care an orphan named Tamru, who was in a very poor health. The child desperately needed life-saving heart surgery, and Yared knew that he was just the person to help. Yared cared for Tamrum and contact, contacted his friend at Seva Child's Heart, Dr. Akiva Tamir and Dr. Tzion Khuri, to work out a plan. Just a few weeks later, Yared and Tamru arrived in Israel together and Tamru underwent life-saving surgery. Even after returning home to Ethiopia, Yared continued to look after Tamru. Today, Yared is 34 years old and still keeps these memories close to his heart. He now has a young daughter, Anna Ami, that he named after the founder of Save a Child's Heart, who saved his life and changed it forever, Dr. Ami Cohen. Yared is planning to reach a milestone of helping 1,000 children in need by the year of 2020. Yared is only one of thousands of promising young people growing up in our world with a bright and promising future after having his life saved by Save a Child's Heart in Israel. Mending the world is not limited only to Save a Child's Heart. Save a Child's Heart work hand in hand with many local and global partners. Permit me to acknowledge the contribution of a number of them. The the Jakaya Kikweti Kardec Institute in Tanzania, Open Heart Institutional from Australia, Mending Kids for the US and Italy, and the generous support of the Australian Pratt Foundation. On our medical missions to Tanzania, we have the pleasure of working with Professor Felix Berger and his team from the Deutsches Herzertum Berlin. In addition, Ein Herz for Kinder for Germany generally supports life-saving treatment for many children from Tanzania and around the world. In Romania, we work with Gregorio Alexandrescu Hospital together with global partners at Rotary, Gift of Life International, International Children's Heart Foundation, and Albany Medical Center. In Ethiopia, we work with Children's Heart Fund Ethiopia, Black Line Hospital, Jima University Medical Center, St. Paul's Millennium Hospital, Mending Kids US, and Chain of Hope UK. At the Palestinian Medical Complex in Ramallah, and in the Palestinian Authority in general, we have the support of USAID, the European Union Peace Building Initiative, the Israeli Ministry of Regional Cooperation, and Shevet Achim. The Israeli Board of Directors, under the leadership of the Chairman Yoram Cohen, who is here with us today, works in partnership with the worldwide... <laughs> ...works in partnership with the worldwide family of Save a Child's Heart in the US, Canada, UK, Netherlands, Australia, Switzerland, South Africa, Kenya, and Ghana. This demanding and relentless work is being conducted meticulously by our Israeli Executive Director, Mr. Simon Fisher. <laughs> Simon and the dedicated team he has assembled have given all their hearts and many years of dedication to growing this organization. Together, we remain committed to the legacy of Dr. Ami Cohen as we share our knowledge, 
give a new lease on life to children throughout the developing world and work towards an even more impactful future. We are currently in the advanced stages of construction of Save a Child's Heart International Pediatric Cardiac Center at a new children's hospital at the Wolfson Medical Center. This has been made possible due to the generous support of the Ministry of Health and the Ministry for Regional Cooperation of the State of Israel, as well as the enormous generosity of numbers of individuals and foundations. Save a Child's Heart is grateful to each and every one of them, but permit me to note in particular Morris Khan, Sylvan Adams, <laughs> the Israeli, the Israeli Foundation, Legacy Harriet Fund, Healthly Charitable Trust, Christians United for Israel, John and Dana Hege, and Kim and Jane Clement. Morris Khan was the first person who was able to predict the importance of Save a Child's Heart. He was our supporter from the very beginning, encouraging us and helping us with all, with all the challenges we faced. Without you, Maurice, we wouldn't be standing here today. <clears throat> Mr. Sylvan Adams and his wife, Margaret, we are captivated by our dream and are committed to taking life saving to the next level. The new children's hospital will be named in honor of Sylvan Adams and the centerpiece will be the Middle East First International Pediatria Cardiac Center. It is indeed the realization of our dream. As you already know, both Mr. Khan and Mr. Adams are here with us this evening. Both are not only major supporters, but also enthusiastic and tireless ambassador of Save a Child's Heart. Thank you, Maurice. Thank you, Sylvan. In this small global village that we all share, we must care for our own children as well as our neighbors. No matter how near or far, for we are all one people, and neither geography nor prejudice should impede us. In the words of the Bible, and common all, to all beliefs, we must each love our neighbor as ourselves. This principle underlies all we do at Save a Child's Heart. To all of us, fortunate enough to be here in the very developed world, I would like to end my speech with words written by the late Dr. Ami Cohen for the next generation of surgeons. And I quote, I am convinced that for the vast majority of people who choose cardiothoracic surgery as a profession, idealism was initially a strong factor. Hold fast to your day after dream vision because if it fades, despite all skills acquired, there will be something missing. Join us. There is work for everybody. There are no dollars and cents in it, but it is worth a fortune. Ami, we can not agree with you more. And therefore, in your words, we can and we should. Thank you very much. Thank you, Dr. Sasson. Deputy Secretary General, Dr. Kanim, members of the committee, the Secretariat of the committee, excellencies, ladies and gentlemen. This concludes the United Nations Population Award Ceremony for 2018. On behalf of the Committee 
for the United Nations Population Award, I thank you all for attending the ceremony this evening. Following tradition, the ceremony will be followed by a reception in the delegates' dining room on the fourth floor. You are all cordially invited to attend. I would also like to thank the New York Symphonic Ensemble for their beautiful music, which which we have greatly enjoyed, especially during the concert that preceded the ceremony. I would like to request the guests in this room to kindly remain seated while the laureates, the members of the committee, Ms. Amina Mohammed and Dr. Kanim leave the room. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.